This podcast is offered through the Sacred Community Project, an inner spiritual collective working to lower the barriers of access to contemplative and devotional practices. Through the universal teachings of love, service, remembrance, and truth, SCP utilizes modern technology to promote eternal values. Learn more at sacredcommunityproject.org. Hello, and welcome to the Sacred Community Podcast. I'm your host, Xander, and today we'll be exploring an excerpt from the Exploring the Hanuman Chalisa audiobook presented by Sita Ram Das. This audiobook was recorded over the COVID-19 pandemic and then revised and edited for indefinite public consumption. The two chapters included in today's programming focus on the form of Hanuman and how we can relate to it, and also duality, devotion, bhav, relativity, flexibility, really all different points of the human experience. These concepts and also the whole book in and of itself, Sitaram presents as an opportunity for each of us to take, if we so wish, as a way to expand our thinking, to approach maybe what's familiar, maybe what's unfamiliar, intentionally. I've personally listened through the audiobook. I can't even tell you how many times because most of the time I'll do it in chunks and it is so rich. I just find myself re-listening to the same chunk to really just absorb everything that's included in it. It's so wonderful. Every time I listen to it, something else sticks out to me. I learn something. It's really got a lot of information, whether the Hanuman Chalisa is something you've been chanting for 50 years, or if this is the first 50 seconds of you ever hearing about it. If any of this offering speaks to you, please check out more at the Sacred Community Project website, sacredcommunityproject.org. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. And also, please leave a rating on whatever platform you're listening to this on. It really does help a lot in letting, letting the algorithm know that this is something people are listening to and help it to spread to even more people and hopefully touch even more souls. And with that, I will cede the floor. Enjoy. I want to talk a little bit about form in general. So there's different ways that we can relate to that. And I'm going to offer three ways today. I imagine there's more, but I'm not going to say which one's right, but I'm just going to offer them is that these are different ways that people can approach this idea of God in form. The theme is multilogical thinking. Can we hold multiple perspectives and allow them all to dig us into that, that deeper ineffable truth? So one that's really popular in the West, especially among people that maybe pride themselves on being intellectual, is this idea that all these different forms of gods, of these deities, that they're different archetypes they point us to the depths of as maybe you and called the collective unconscious. And there is some weight to that, right? Like even, you know, in India, I mean, all sorts of people will talk about the different metaphorical meanings of all these different aspects of Hanuman's form, right? Even Hanuman's curly hair, I've heard it described as is symbolic of the thrill of Hanuman's devotion. Yeah. And Hanuman's earrings, they're these heavy earrings, right? And they pull down his ears and it shows that Hanuman's ears are ever ready to hear the stories of Ram. Yeah, and of course that mace, I mean the weapons and the iconography, that's what destroys our ignorance, right? The five kleshas we talked about. The thread, the sacred thread that Hanuman wears shows that Hanuman's mind is always in the absolute, is always in truth. So we get that, that kind of metaphorical layers of it. And there's an element too, right? I mean, if we remember that Hanuman is devotion and service, that that's what Hanuman is. And of course, those two things aren't separate. For devotees, service is just a form of devotion. If we're really devoted to God and if we realize that God is everywhere, then 
you have to be of service, right? That means service to the earth. That means service to other people. And if our devotion is really intense and sincere, we're probably going to look for all the ways that we're not yet viewing the world as a manifestation of God. Yeah. All the ways that we've turned a blind eye to various peoples and their sufferings or various exploitations, different cultures on the planet. So we can view Hanuman as that, right? Is like a form of devotion. And by looking at Hanuman, right, it's said to awaken these different qualities in us. And that's one way of looking at it. And then there's people like Joseph Campbell that talk about how ritual is really a way that we bring down this mythological realm into reality, right? So by looking at the pictures of Hanuman, by singing to Hanuman, by offering Hanuman food, that we're doing something, we're programming our mind in a certain way, it's causing some change in us. Okay. So it's one way that we can relate to form. And I think for a lot of us in the West, um, that's kind of how we first start to wrap our head around it and how we first start to allow ourselves to get into it and to try it out. Seems to just make sense to us. But what many of us find after doing these practices for a while, that although that still makes sense on some level, it doesn't really feel like it fully captures the truth. And so we start to move into these other areas that maybe at the beginning of our journey wouldn't have made sense to us. Yeah. And so there's another way that we can look at all this, which is that Hanuman is a doorway to God. The name itself is is a doorway. It is a perfect mirror. It's a perfect form. It's like a sonic murti. Yeah, it's a perfect manifestation of that ineffable presence in our heart. And by saying the name, we awaken that presence. Yeah. And that the visual form of Hanuman, by looking at a murti, by looking at an image, that, that too is a perfect mirror of our heart. And that the stories also are perfect doorway in, perfect mirror of our heart. And in a way, that second one isn't that much different from the first. It just caused a little bit less explanation. But for devotees, there is a difference. And, and the difference is important. But there's another way I want to offer too. And when you get to this way, you know that you've really, you've really drank the Kool-Aid. Um, the other thing that happens to many of us is we've been on the path for a while and it just starts to make sense at some point that, that yes, it's true that Hanuman is a perfect mirror of the heart, right? But in reality, all beings are a mirror of the heart. In reality, we're all one. But if Hanuman's a more perfect mirror, well, just as we consider other beings are real, like other beings with physical bodies that walk around, um, we view that they're real. At some point, we realize that Hanuman's not really any less real as a separate being as any of these other people. And then it completely shifts at that point, because then when we say the name Hanuman, we're saying someone's name. Yeah, and we, we look at the form of Hanuman, we're looking at the form of someone, and when we sing... The Hanuman Chalisa, we're singing to someone. And that's an interesting one because just like if we have people in our life that we really love, like let's say we have partners, husbands, wives, um, kids, sometimes we put their pictures in our wallet, sometimes we put their pictures on our desk at our office, right, at our job. And when we look at them, we feel love in our heart. And that's why we do that. You know, it's like it's nice to remember them and to keep them in our mind. And of course, if we're really in love with someone, sometimes we write them love poems or we sing them love songs. So we start to realize that Hanuman is real and then we just fall in love. And then we know all the other stuff is true, but it just doesn't seem to matter anymore. We're not actually singing to Hanuman for any purpose other than we're just in love with Hanuman. And if we offer Hanuman some fruits, we're offering... Hanuman fruits the same way we would offer fruits to our lover. Yeah. And if we like want Hanuman's picture around, it's because we're in love with Hanuman and we want to remember Hanuman. That's that realm of devotion. 
And of course, in that realm, right, it's said that doing all these things is good for us. But for the devotee, like that doesn't even really matter so much. It's just about the fact that we're in love. This is also where it gets really interesting, right? Because as it says in the Narada Bhakti Sutras, we don't practice devotion to get something else. We don't practice love to get something else. It is its own reward. So even though we often express devotion through duality, right? There's a certain language of devotion, right? I'm in love with you. That involves two people. That's a certain language of devotion. But bhav, the devotional mood that's awakened to that love poetry, that dualistic love poetry, the bhav is a non-dual state. Yeah? It's a non-dual state. So... What the teachings say is that we just keep falling in love and that love just takes us over, over time until it's the only thing that's left. But once we've fallen in love, it's not really about some goal anymore. Love has just overtaken our heart and that inner intelligence is just working its way. And this kind of multilogical thinking, I want to say a few more things about this because it's integral into all of the Puranas and and Vedic thought and the fact that we have all these different sacred stories that, that say that this particular deity, whether it's Devi or Shiva or Sri Hari, they say that these deities are the highest deity, right? And then they place the other deities in relationship to that deity. Well, all these texts are considered sacred text. So there's this understanding, there's this inherent understanding of the relativity of language. What Alfred Kazipsi called the map is not the territory. Our ideas about the universe are not the same as the universe itself. So when we're in love with someone, like no one wants to hear on a date, like, oh, you know, you, you're pretty beautiful. You know, like I've met other beautiful people and like, they were cool too, you know, but you're also pretty cool, you know? And, um, yeah, I think I want to keep hanging out with you. Like no one really wants to hear that. And we don't even really want to say that when we're in love with someone, they actually just are the most beautiful person that's ever existed and you know, all of eternity. And, and we can have those moments. And sometimes that kind of language, that kind of devotional language is actually the most accurate statement of truth. And of course, in another situation, it's not going to be right. If people are fighting wars over whose deity is the highest doesn't seem to me like that's a very high statement of truth. So we can see that a specific type of language can function in one situation one way, but in another situation it can function another way. And yeah, I am going to go there. This is something that is on my mind. So a lot of us in the West, um, the whole way we got into the spiritual path is to this idea of opening up, right? We were kind of stuck in some type of rigid worldview. Maybe it was we were, grew up in fundamentalist Christianity, or maybe it was fundamentalist materialism. And so through this practice of opening up, we opened up away from that. And that's how we found our way into the spiritual path. And it took a lot of work for us to open up from that. But what happens is um, it's actually something Robert Anton Wilson calls chapel perilous is when we first open up from this rigid view of reality, because that rigid view is kind of holding things together for a while. We first open up, but we don't actually have the skills or the knowledge yet to be able to navigate what's left when we've opened up from that. We don't have the protective factors. And so even those of us that have found, you know, maybe we've gone back to ancient traditions from our own culture that were lost or we found spiritual traditions from other cultures. We don't even know to look at the protective factors that are in those cultures to protect us from now that we've opened our mind from all the other influences that can come in. And so what often happens is that one, we either form a new worldview that's just as rigid as the other one, or we just kind of get into this space where everything is so relative that we just can't differentiate up from down. I've witnessed over the last few months people using nonviolent communication techniques to try and discuss online the reasons why they support Donald Trump 
and then they think that he's a good president because he's trying to uncover these pedophile rings, right? Just today, I heard someone on social media really using extremely compassionate language to talk about how they didn't understand why people aren't willing to see both sides, right, of this Q QAnon thing, you know? And that's obviously ridiculous, right? I mean, that's when Ram Dass talks about how we need to remember our zip code, this is the kind of protective factors that we're talking about, right? We distrust mainstream media, but we're willing to believe the YouTube guy. So in multilogical thinking, we open up our mind and we start to be able to see things in a little bit more probabilities, right? And we start to be able to kind of dance with these various ideas and to see if they're effective or not. But it doesn't mean that that we have lost our discernment, right? Like, yeah, like I can question everything, but I'm still like 99.999% sure that if I were to pick up my phone right now and drop it, that it would fall on the floor. Yeah. I'm so sure of that, that I could just say that it's a fact. It still exists in this realm of probability, but it's like over here, right? Versus like, yeah, maybe I could be open to the idea. I mean, maybe... Maybe our president is a, trying to uncover a secret pedophile ring. But also, the chances of that are so minusculely slim, might as well just say that that's absolutely false. Yeah? So, we can see that. The areas where we dance around things, I mean, there is this space that opens up in the middle, right? There's this gray area where um, there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties, and, and that's where we use these techniques to kind of explore and swim around. But we, we, we still get to kind of use the scientific method and, you know, multilogical thinking doesn't mean some kind of extreme relativity, right? I mean, there's that ancient story in India of the blind men around the elephant, right? And they all see something different, but there's still this understanding that there is an elephant there. Yeah. And so for us on the spiritual path, we're using these different belief systems and worldviews and stories because they're orienting us to ineffable truth. There is an absolute this, that all of these relativities center around. It's just that that absolute is ineffable. And so it gives us a weight. If the map is not the territory, we still have a certain, we, we still have a territory to judge if our map is helping us accurately navigate the territory or not. So some of the protective factors that we can use is one, if God is love and God is truth, then our map of reality should be taking us towards that. Yeah. And if we're led to believe that Dharma is important, that showing kindness and compassion and being of service is important, then our map should allow us to do that. Yeah. The people that are saying, being really kind and compassionate about looking at both sides of this QAnon conspiracy, um, their heart's in the right place, but are they really able to be of service? Is their map of reality allowing them to be of service in a way that's actually helpful, that's actually going to relieve suffering? Yeah? So we do have a ground. That groundlessness of being is our ground. Um, love and kindness and truth. We orient ourselves to those things. So... Multilogical thinking, we look at things, we dance from these different perspectives, but but yeah, we check in and we use these protective factors. Humility is a great one. Humility is what allows us to look at experts that have spent their entire lives studying something and to just assume that maybe they know more about that than we do. Yeah, humility, discernment. These are great protective factors.